A few weeks ago, I tested the AMD Ryzen 7 4700G, the processor closest to the one used in the Xbox Series X. A couple weeks after that, I tested the Radeon RX 6700, the GPU closest to the one used in the PlayStation 5, and that got me thinking. I have a console CPU in one hand and a console GPU in the other. What happens when I put my hands together? I bent the pins. Behold, the Icebox DIY 9th generation console. Yes, I know it's a cardboard box test bench. We can all see that, thank you very much. Being a pedant doesn't make people like you, you know. Behold, the Icebox Alpha version 0.5. If I were making a finalised version, it would be more polished, shrunk down using a mini ITX motherboard and other small form factor components to better fit into a space under the TV, but for the time being, this is just a proof of concept. The concept that needs proving is that I can build my own DIY console using the closest components available to those used in the real thing. Note, I'm not calling this a console killer. That would imply a PC which can match or beat a console for a similar price, and if that had been my goal, I'd have blown the budget with just two main components. I'm using the nearest commercially available CPU and GPU to try and achieve the same end goal as Sony and Microsoft, and that comes at a substantially higher cost, even without the expensive smaller scale components. Thankfully, these near equivalents are easy enough to come by, However, that doesn't necessarily mean there were the best possible choices. Starting with the CPU, or rather the APU, the Ryzen 7 4700G, and this has become something of a pain point. The Ryzen 7 3700X is the CPU most people have often assumed is the closest console equivalent, and in fairness, it would be a more desirable CPU to use in a gaming PC. However, in this context, the 3700X is a little too good. The Ryzen 7 4700G's CPU element lacks L3 cache when compared to the 3700X, which actually makes it less suitable for high-performance gaming, but this shortfall is also what makes it the closest you can get to the Xbox's CPU today. Sony haven't disclosed as much detailed information about the CPU in the PS5, but it's a reasonable bet that it's still closer to the 4700G than any other socketed Ryzen processor available. Thankfully, despite its shortcomings compared to the full-fat 3700X, it's still a pretty capable and efficient CPU. It runs at a base clock of 3.6GHz, which I've locked in by using a manual 36x multiplier and by turning off PBO and other turbo features. Under normal circumstances, it would still be a 65W part, and so, with all of its turbo tendencies turned off, a basic Wraith stealth should be sufficient to keep it cool. However, while that APU might have a serviceable enough integrated graphics solution on board, suitable for eSports or GTA 5 at normal settings, it's not going to be up to snuff for this video. Instead, I'm pairing the 4700G with the Radeon RX 6700, a core count match to the PS5 with only 10 gigs of GDDR6 and other not quite perfectly aligned specs to the console. The 6700 has its own level 3 cache problem, in that it has one, whereas the console's GPU doesn't. Depending on how you interpret the specs, the Radeon card has either significantly less memory bandwidth due to its slower RAM and reduced bus width, or significantly higher bandwidth thanks to this Infinity cache. It's not infinite, it's 80 megabytes, but its stated purpose is to replace the need for a 512-bit memory bus. Now, if the RX 6700 did have a 512-bit bus, that would give it 1024 gigabytes a second of bandwidth, more than double that of the PS5, more than triple the quoted bandwidth of the card, hell, more bandwidth even than the RTX 4090. Is this true? Is it marketing hyperbole? Would it even help? Who knows, I think it's unlikely that Infinity Cache can actually fulfil that promise, 
but it might at least overcome the bandwidth deficit between the graphics card and the console. Like I said in the previous video, as I can't really do much to calculate the impact of Infinity Cache, I prefer to not worry about it. As for overall performance, I'm in console territory, so I suppose I'd better speak the lingo. The PS5's GPU puts out 10.29 teraflops, whereas the stock 6700 operates at 11.29 teraflops at its peak boost speed. In the last video, I aimed to match the clock speed of the PS5, 2233 MHz, which meant that the 6700 would now also put out 10.29 teraflops. We have the same number of shader units, the same number of texture mapping units, the same number of render output units, and roughly the same number of teraflops. It's a pretty close match to the PS5, but okay, it might not be exactly the same. Infinity Cache aside, there's rumours that the PS5 is more of an RDNA 1.5 than full RDNA 2, but from what I can tell, even if true, that's kind of a moot point. Hardware Unboxed dropped a 6700 XT and a 5700 XT to the same clock speeds, and they performed about the same as each other. I presume they didn't overclock the 5700 XT to match the RDNA 2 card because, well, RDNA 1 just doesn't clock that high. Regardless, this indicates to me that the IPC gain between the two generations of RDNA is negligible. Like RDNA 2, the PS5's GPU is capable of ray tracing using the texture mapping units to double up as ray tracing calculators, whereas the PC version of RDNA 1 can't, at least not yet. Anyway, none of that really matters. For this challenge, I'm not focusing on literally building a PlayStation replica, but more of an homage, so rather than focusing on downclocking the RX 6700 to a specific frequency, I'm instead working to a particular power envelope. According to Austin Evans, the various models of PS5 consume between 200 and 230 watts of power, so I'm going to play with voltage and power limits to try and keep the full consumption of the PC to about that same amount. More on that later. Memory would prove to be a difficult choice. There's simply no practical way of directly reproducing the 9th gen console's 16GB of GDDR6 VRAM. For part of 2022, it was possible to buy console reject parts from AMD in the form of the 4700S desktop kit, which has a console's CPU and RAM soldered onto a PC motherboard. But its PCIe slot is only wired up for four lanes and has no NVMe support, so its use in a gaming PC is dubious at best. Xbox Series X's memory structure features a 10GB pool for VRAM, 3.5GB for system RAM and 2.5GB for the OS. Technically, this means I could get away with 6GB of system RAM, as my GPU has 10GB on board already, but my experience in the last couple of years tells me that won't be enough for PC games. The 4700G has an excellent memory controller, so I was able to clock this cheap dual-channel 16GB kit to its full 4000 mega transfers with a 1 to 1 fabric ratio, and I managed to get marginally tighter timings of 18 22 22 42 to help improve latency. In an ideal world, I'd have 4 sticks, as Ryzen is supposed to perform a little better that way, but the only 4GB sticks I have are much slower 3200 speed RAM, and it didn't take well to my attempts at overclocking or reducing timings. Storage would become another area that made me regret my previous choices. Whereas the PS5 and Xbox both make use of Gen 4 PCI Express, the 4700G processor does not. Regardless of my choice of motherboard, any Gen 4 SSD I use would be limited to Gen 3 speeds because of this bottleneck. And for all I knew, this could prove to be a limiting factor when building my console competitor. On the other hand, it did mean I got to cut corners on some components, so I'm reusing a cheap Gen 3 1TB drive I've had for a couple of years. The motherboard was another corner I felt the need to cut. This Gigabyte Gaming X motherboard is a full ATX size unit using the B550 chipset, so if I chose to upgrade the CPU to a 3700X or 5700X later on, I'd be free to do so, though, as pointed out, I've already locked myself into a Gen 3 SSD. If I were pushing the boat out for a full version 1 of this build, I'd probably go for an ITX board instead, 
but for this proof of concept, it'll have to do. Finally, the OS. I had initially thought that Chimera OS would have been a perfect fit for a console PC build. It's a Linux distro built around the Steam Deck OS, so it's already designed for a console type environment. In fact, I was so convinced that this was the right choice, I actually installed it, downloaded a bunch of games and captured a ton of footage with it. However, all that will have to wait for another video, because as it turns out, Chimera OS has a fatal flaw. The point of this build is that it does what consoles do, and one thing Chimera can't do is enable ray tracing. I hope this is something that makes its way to a future build of the OS, but for the time being I had to revert to Windows. To get the authentic experience of a console type machine however, I still have options. I could have looked at launchers like Launchbox, but I was running out of time to get the video done, so I stuck with what I know. I set Steam to launch into big screen mode and voila, one Windows based gaming friendly UI that can be used to buy a controller. So with all that preamble out of the way, I started with a quick revisit to The Last of Us, in the somewhat vain hope that perhaps there'd been a patch or update that dramatically improved things. As there's no data available for the console equivalent settings, as far as I can tell, I once more started with the medium preset and a few of the more VRAM hungry settings turned up to high. This saw an average just shy of 30 FPS, with dips to 24, only a couple of frames slower than the previous testing with the 5600X. However, I carried on a little further to capture some more interesting footage, and the loading stutters and frequent drops in combat were pretty rough. In the long run, I'd probably drop resolution scaling to 80 or 90% in order to lock in at 30 FPS, but alas, I don't think anything can quite compensate for the shoddiness of this game's PC port right now. The game is gorgeous, but there's no way a non-RT title should cause this much trouble. Having recently paid my extra few quid to upgrade my copy of Death Stranding to the director's cut, I thought it was worth including in this test. From what I hear, the game's default quality settings are a perfect match to the PS5, though that doesn't mean this was as simple as all that. Running through the first delivery of the game with VSync enabled was possible at an average of 60fps, but 1% lows dropped all the way down to 24. Cutscenes perform much worse, especially if you're watching the frame time graph. The reason this PS5 equivalent hardware isn't performing up to console standards here is because the console renders the game at 1800p, an option which is unavailable to PC users. There are however a variety of upscalers to choose from, and while FSR 1 delivers the highest resolution original, FSR 2 has the edge in visual fidelity at the cost of some relative performance. Upscaling from 1440p, FSR 2 quality can deliver a nearly locked 60fps in gameplay, and cutscenes also don't wander much from that either. Control's console equivalent settings came straight from the horse's mouth. Developer Remedy furnished Digital Foundry with the exact settings used by the PS5, and with the exception of a couple of settings which are below the minimum available on PC, everything else is very achievable. With these dialed in, a render resolution of 1440p output at 2160, settings mostly at low and medium with RT reflections on but diffuse lighting and contact shadows turned off, it's possible to achieve a locked 30fps. Turning RT off sees an unlocked FPS of 95, with minimums just under 80, so there's room to turn up a few quality settings if I had a 60fps target in mind. Elden Ring's console versions rely pretty heavily on DRS, or dynamic resolution scaling, at least in performance and RT modes. The PC version unfortunately lacks this DRS option, which given how poorly the UI handles resolution changes isn't that big of a surprise, but is an unfortunate absence. No matter, while aiming for the performance preset, I used the DF console equivalent settings and a resolution of 3200 by 1800. This retained a very smooth, nearly locked 60fps, with dips only into the mid 50s. The quality mode settings are only a couple of notches above the performance mode. The difference here is that the consoles lock resolution at 4K and leave the frame rate uncapped. 
This is reported to go as high as 60, but more frequently into the 40s and 50s. I only saw an average of 50 FPS, with lows falling as far as 42. Taking the quality mode settings, dropping resolution to 1440 and adding high RT saw FPS drop into the low to mid 30s and with a 30 FPS cap added in Revertuner I was able to obtain a pretty perfect locked experience that looked excellent and was surprisingly playable. In fact I'd probably prefer this mode over the more variable quality mode and I think I'd take performance over either. I'll say one thing for Red Dead Redemption 2. Its quality settings are comprehensive. It took almost as long to input DF's console equivalent settings as it did to run around Saint Denis for a benchmark run. In lighter areas, reaching 60 FPS at full 4K is a very achievable goal, but within city limits, forested areas, and other complex scenes, that can drop a lot. Hence the average FPS of 54 and lows of 43. Of course, as there's still no official 9th gen patch, console owners are stuck with 30 FPS, so locking at 30 using Revertuner is still effectively a console-like experience, and you might even get away with locking at a higher frame rate. Although Horizon Zero Dawn is a PS4 title, it came late enough in the generation to be tricky to run. The original game ran at a checkerboard 4K at 30fps on a PS4 Pro, and the only difference from running it on PS5 is that the frame rate now goes up to 60. Checkerboard rendering isn't an option on the PC version, so a perfect match isn't possible, but we do have the luxury of a couple of upscalers. Though, unfortunately, it looks like DLSS is the only temporal upscaler, as the FSR is only version 1. At ultra quality, the game is rendering internally at 1660p and can provide a mostly solid 60fps. Dropping to quality or using dynamic resolution scaling with a 60 target could resolve this. As you can see from the afterburner overlay, the Ryzen CPU is sipping power most of the time, and with reduced clocks, voltage and power limit, the Radeon GPU tops out at between 110 and 130 watts. A reading from the wall during a canned Forza benchmark saw the total build drawing around 230 watts, which is on par with an older model PS5, and 20 to 30 watts higher than the newer models. I'm pretty satisfied with this, but if I were going to make a bigger deal about it, I might start by dropping the RAM to lower clocks and looser timings to see if I can run it at 1.2 volts rather than the 1.4 set in the XMP. I'd also spend more time refining the Ryzen's power settings, as frankly I didn't do much more than fix the multiplier and disable turbo boost and PBO. The GPU itself is probably as low as I'd want to go, with the clock set at 2400, power limit to minus 6%, and core under voltage to 1160mV. Though, if I were happy with lower performance and relying more on upscaling, I think that would be the most effective way of hitting the 200 watt mark. And I have to cut it off there. I tested the Ryzen 7 4700G and Radeon RX 6700 in their own standalone videos, which if you haven't watched yet, there's a link to them in the description. I did want to revisit Jedi Survivor to see how the last few weeks have affected its performance, but the game decided to start acting up and wouldn't boot at all, giving me out of memory errors even at 1440p, so I guess that'll have to wait. Keep an eye out in a few weeks' time, where I'll hopefully find a use for all the Chimera OS footage I grabbed for this video, and that ultimately didn't get used. Thanks for watching, kindly do the usual YouTube things if you feel so inclined, and I'll see you next time.